Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And once again, we have a very interesting guest with us today. And uh, before I introduce you to you, I just want to uh, take and also thank you for following our effort. And I hope you're enjoying. And uh, you have any feedback, do share. Some of you are sharing feedback and we really appreciate it. And for those of you who are not sharing your thoughts, please feel free to share the thought. And does it does take an effort that you have to subscribe to share your opinion. So please do that and share it with all those who you think will appreciate it. And with that, I just want to bring our guest, Gulrez Hoda. And uh, he's started his career as an uh, officer in the Indian Administrative Services. And uh, uh, a great journey, we'll discuss that. And from there on, he moved into financial uh, world, uh, World Bank. He got started and then into financial uh, businesses and then uh, uh, he started uh, Hikmat Foundation, so which is what he currently runs as founder president, uh, which is focused at girl education in rural Bihar. So uh, uh, that's just the highlight of it and what and who uh, Gulrez Hoda will hear it from him. So Gulrez, thank you so much for making time and welcome to Future Fast. Thank you so much, Nandu. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, I look forward to this conversation. Wonderful. So, can you please? Uh, uh, that that I, I'm sure you must be asked many times that why IAS or is that a natural thing? That those days it was the best option to take up. In fact, it was. I, I mean, we we are, uh, I think, the first uh, post independence generation, if you will. Um, all of us are sort of early fifties born uh, and um, you know it was a country was growing but in terms of opportunities uh, um, when we finished school um, uh, you either became an engineer or a doctor or you went into civil services of course there was also a stream which went into the corporate sector i mean you had uh, things like tas tata administrative services uh, they would recruit a lot of pf talent uh, you also had the foreign banks who would go in. Uh, but um, yes, if you didn't become an engineer and a doctor, uh, civil service was definitely an option one looked at. And uh, was there any family motivation or somebody that actually drove you to it? Or was that a peer thing that you were in a group and who all wanted to do that? I mean, what drove you towards that? Well, uh, I mean, um, in the sense that uh, uh, very early I went to a boarding school. Um, actually, I went to a school run by Jesuits, uh, uh, St. Xavier School in Hazaribagh. Uh, we had Australian Jesuits. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing about uh, that school and the thing about Jesuits, especially Australian Jesuits, is that... Uh, uh, apart from focusing on studies, uh, they also focused a lot on uh, other things. I mean, sports obviously was one. Uh, the great fans of uh, sports, these Aussies. Um, and But in addition to that, they also talked a lot about society, people. Uh, they themselves were working in a lot in the tribal areas. Uh, so somewhere, I think, uh, this rubbed off on many of us uh, who went to these schools. Um, after schooling, I went to Delhi University. I mean, my two elder brothers were already doctors. So I, I guess in my parents' view, they thought that uh, medicine was not for me. Um, maybe I should have become an engineer, but uh, somehow I landed up in uh, Delhi University, St. Stephen's College, uh, which was a very different world. We had uh, people from all over the country, a lot of boys from the South as well. Um, it was a very enriching experience, uh, but uh, coming out of St. Stephen's, uh, uh, it was either the sort of chosen corporate sector or the civil services, uh, um, and, and we went for the civil service. Uh, um, for instance, in my class on economics, uh, I studied economics in college. Uh, I think there were 30 of us, and I think 15 or 14 must have gone into the civil services and the rest into the corporate world. Uh, 
uh, one became a f filmmaker, Ketan Mehta, you know. And uh, so we had a mixed uh, mixed lot. No regrets. I think uh, the civil services uh, was a good place to land up during that time. A uh, lot was happening in the country, and we were all very excited when we sort of got an opportunity to do that. And... Uh, uh... Even today, civil services is looked at as the best option by uh, a significant population, at least up north. In south, uh, uh, in fact, at least where I come from in Bangalore and Karnataka, there is hardly much interest. Uh, uh, people rather go to a uh, corporate sector. Or, I mean, this is uh, there, but in a very small uh, percentage. But I think uh, uh, north is still significantly... Uh, looked at as it and sometimes uh, in fact uh, I, I don't know if I asked uh, this question to Bala there is there is a uh, uh, God syndrome <laughs> among the bureaucrats uh, did you ever feel that? No I think uh, there, there is definitely a glamour to uh, to the civil services uh, in, in the northern part of the country um, and even once we were in the service our colleagues uh, who were working in the south and the west, um, they ha they came across as uh, having different reactions or what they felt when they got into a professional mode. Uh, there is, uh, I've tried to understand what happens here. Of course, government service, uh, even at the uh, time when a lot of people are going to the corporate world, it gives you certain security. Um, uh, but I think the whole uh, IES, ICS, uh, there is a colonial uh, tone to it, uh, if I may say so, and uh, unfortunately so. And, I, I uh, would have said that, uh, wondering <laughs> whether you will not like it, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, it is a fact of life, and uh, uh, I that mean... Babu uh, Dham, uh, Babu Giri thing. Babu uh, Dham, and uh, I mean... Um, Sometimes uh, amongst our friends, we talk about these things. And uh, I mean, look at it, you know, the district administrator, I don't know. Uh, the Jagedars of the old were also a district administrator, which the British took over and made them collectors. And uh, we continued with that uh, post-47. And uh, uh, finally, that British time... didn't use that system in uh, their own countries. Exactly. Uh, um, so, I mean, there is definitely a colonial, I think it also sort of reflects some sort of a feudal mindset, if I can say so. And uh, um, But mind you, I mean, working as the district collector or even a subdivisional magistrate is a very small portion of uh, your IES career, uh, you know, over 30, 35 years. Uh, most of the time is spent either... Uh, in policy making uh, positions in the state and um, in, in the government of India. But somehow it's the district magistrate, the collector, the deputy commissioner, we, we go by different names, uh, which sort of gets highlighted. Uh, um, and, and it's quite intoxicating. I mean, unless you're really balanced, uh, many young officers seem to get swept off their feet. Because here you are in your late 20s, I think. We become collectors when you're 27, 28, in some stakes 30. And you have people twice your age serving you and hanging around you. Um, all they are doing, though, is hanging around your chair, <laughs> which is not yours. But uh, no, I mean, that apart, I think uh, uh, going forward, I and many of my colleagues firmly believe that maybe so many years after 47, uh, we need to have a rethink of how we deliver governance in uh, at at the rural and at the district level. But maybe we can talk more about it when we come when we talk about the future. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, but uh, how did you manage to you know find ground? Because, like you said, right, that age is also such that it's very easy to be swept off, uh, get carried away with that. I, uh, of uh, that influence and power and everybody bowing to you, even people twice your age. So how did you manage to stay on the ground? Was it your family or friends? Or... 
<laughs> See, I I went to work uh, uh, in another state. Uh, initially, I was in Assam. Yes, and we are the generation of IS officers in Assam. Uh, we had to deal with this uh, student agitation, uh, you know, the anti-foreigners movement, uh, right. which sort of really started when we hit the districts uh, in... Uh, uh, 79, 80, 81, this was the time. Um, so in a way, most of our work, because of the agitation, and it was one con continuous process, uh, even when we went into the districts, most of it was what is euphemistic, euphemistic called law and order. I mean, uh, it was public order, there was public agitation. And uh, the sort of normal part of a district collector's job, which is land administration or supply, uh, they had all become secondary. So in a way, the context was such uh, that uh, hierarchies or, uh, you know, the, the risk of being swept away your feet uh, was lessened to that effect because it was like an emergency. Uh, you, you are putting out so many fires that uh, you didn't have much time uh, to think about anything else. Um, and I, once the sort of, I left Assam, um, 86, I think it was, uh, when they, uh, and by that time I went off to the U.S. I, you know, the government sent me in a fellowship to the U.S. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, because of the sort of, uh, most of the time was spent on putting out fires, uh, the normal uh, feudalism, if you will, of a district officer's life uh, escaped us. Uh, though in hindsight, I mean, one does uh, wonder that if we were to relive this, would one deal with, with uh, more maturity? And um, I think there were many instances uh, uh, where we had presumed that we knew everything. And, and as you age and you mature and in hindsight, um, I think some of those decisions were wrong, and uh, <laughs> I have no shame in admitting it. <laughs> now, is, is that the thought process when you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the whole system needs to be relooked at? Uh, because uh, is that uh, one of the triggers for you, or is it something else that what you see in the current uh, uh, style of administration that? Uh, make you think like this? I think this style of administration and uh, okay. and especially when I see this uh, model work in UP and Bihar, uh, which I think is uh, far more feudal than uh, Assam uh, or eastern parts of the country as well. I mean, I there's so much power which a district officer exercises. And um, I, I do feel that... Um, much greater degree of maturity is required to exercise those powers. Uh, especially now that I live in a village in uh, North Bihar, in Lauria. So I can sort of look up into the chair of the district magistrate. And, and I visualize that, is this the best way to run this blessed place? And uh, one has questions. And uh, so definitely, you know, can we think of uh, a more sort of uh, dispersed power centers you know, at the district level. Uh, it's it's very sort of tempting to presume uh, that even the political executive wants a single window clearance. So maybe at the district level, they just want to go to one person uh, who delivers it. Um, I, I can't think of any other explanation. Uh, why the political executive, which is under so much more pressure than a bureaucrat to deliver, uh, still chooses to have one person at the apex to deliver all that the people are asking him to deliver. So, yes, there are a lot of questions in my mind, uh, some of it driven by my own experience, some of it uh, of talking to many colleagues uh, who have had or who think uh, that they have doubts in their mind. And more recently, because I have first-hand uh, experience of being a subject, if you will, and not being in the chair, uh, but being a citizen in a district, uh, trying to do lead my own life. Well, uh, uh, 
uh, from your own experience to what you see now as a subject or a citizen that you mentioned uh, how do you see the uh, do you see a change in uh, 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 any sense of accountability for an administrative services <laughs> officer i think the life of a district officer uh, and and uh, of course it's a mistake to only focus on the district officer um but that's the most visible part as we talked about no but across I, every level do you see uh uh, uh a degree of accountability uh, has it changed from your times to today from as a as you as an observer that you are today and you can compare to your own experience notes and what you see as an experience as a citizen yeah it's difficult to say nanju because as an outsider you sort of you don't have all the information and and things are extremely impressionistic but i think the political executive of today is far more aggressive and far more uh, protector of its turf and wanting to get things i think i was saying that uh, the sort of social background has uh, uh, changed uh, Mm, which is a positive i i think uh, we should have people from uh, the diverse background which we have um but i also find the degree of freedom of uh, the bureaucrats today um i suspect is far less uh, than um, you know maybe 30 years back when we had joined this service um i i think they have the guardrails are uh, much stronger i think therefore which forces them to get aligned um, to uh, uh, the political executive executive much earlier in their careers uh, and and they ride along those uh, um, so i i think these are such, some some impressionistic uh, um, observations uh, uh, again i am not inside so i don't know what's really happening <laughs> right Uh, no there is uh, also some comments like uh, 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 the political executives are right up front right i mean uh, they are the most visible uh, 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 what do you say they are the visible part of the administration for the citizen so uh, and uh, despite parties changing uh, people changing uh, some of corruption got sustained in the system so there is one section of uh, conversation is that uh, this is sustained by the administrative services people so uh, that's where uh, uh, many a times uh, uh, politicians come but uh, they come out to be clean but they end up being corrupt so uh, is that a fair statement one and two if it is not a fair statement where is who who forms that system in your opinion no i think anecdotally again um, um, i think um, corruption is far more pervasive uh, if i may say so uh, uh, than it was earlier um, i and again it's very anecdotal but then Uh, when i talk to my colleagues uh, that seems to be the general assessment uh, uh, so so that's one uh, one level um, i think the political executives need for collection uh, is to a great extent driven by the political system we run uh, ex- elections are extremely expensive uh, uh, to manage the sort of life of a politician and it, their followers <laughs> Uh, you need humongous sums of money and uh, what i observe now at the grassroots levels is that you collect to get us office and you use the office to collect to get re- collect, uh, to get reelected <laughs> excuse me so so there is there is the demand for corruption is extremely high and um, i think it's it's no secret that the penalty for corruption uh, especially at the lower end of the scale uh, is not very high i mean uh, you know people say everybody is doing it it's a, 
it's a way of life and um, i think bureaucrats uh, i would presume uh, they would be sort of uh, part of the chain not all uh, but uh, those who wish for that life uh, they'll be part of the chain and uh, and they would also sort of get their pound of flesh if you will right so uh so who in your opinion uh forms the system who sustains it i'm i'm just curious is it the uh combination of this or is there a uh, you know the conspiracy theories in the west right there is a uh, uh there is a government but there is a system which runs the government and everything else in that sense is there something like that in india or who forms it if there is something whether is that the only politicians or exclusively uh, the bureaucratic community or is there a combination of it or is there something outside of these sports uh, yeah the, in the in the west they call it the deep state deep and state yes. also use <laughs> uh, we uh-huh. also use this terminology i think all uh, societies have a deep state um, and and i think these sort of who are members of uh, the governing elite or the power elite um, or who sort of uh, who drive things uh, is a combination of political affiliation bureaucratic uh, alignments uh, uh, in our country i think caste is a major uh, a uh, determinant of uh, who is at at one moment a part of the political uh, elite um, the professional background so uh, and and it's this is a very fluid core if you will i mean people move in and out of this uh, um so uh, i i don't think there is a predetermined conspiracy i mean uh, i think seeking power and executing power um i think is intrinsic to all societies and uh, the political context if you will uh, which is given the name of a democratic process is just one sort of uh, uh, manifestation of uh, how you seek power and how you execute power i mean my own belief is that uh, uh, most of the corruption we see in governance is linked to our uh, democratic processes and electoral processes if we had uh, transparent funding if we had transparent accounting uh, i think that is the root cause of corruption i i don't think it's some evil politician or evil bureaucrat uh, who drives it but for a politician to successful he needs money and uh, his instruments are people who sign the checks and who issue the orders and those are the bureaucrats so then the sort of chain forms uh, but uh, i i my belief again is that uh, the driving force is the need for uh, money in electoral politics um, if if we can somehow close it from that angle um, one could think of making a dent on corruption uh, i mean uh, even just very severe penalties to my mind Uh, would not be sufficient to choke this off right well uh, uh, sorry i don't know how we got into corruption but one last question on this <laughs> some years back i i, I was reading uh, something where it said that 2000 people run this country uh, and uh, this 2000 people come from a set of uh, families uh who have multiple generation or a uh, lot of people coming uh, from into bureaucracy from one family and uh, a lot of people i think uh, the number was nearly 400 people forming uh, judiciary from the time of independence to today that is this is few years ago so it's uh, there are multiple generations of people in the judiciary coming from it which is also even currently we have one who is uh, uh, lineage in the judiciary itself goes within the supreme court and likewise in all high courts and likewise in the ias ips bureaucracy and politics so the argument uh, that article uh, i kept searching i couldn't find it i had read a physical what i was trying to look up i don't remember the title so uh, is that a deep state well i think uh, that's expanded a little bit i think your example of the judiciary is uh, very correct 
I mean, given the collegium system, uh, a lot of people have spoken about uh, uh, the effect of the collegium system. Uh, uh, there is a seems to be a, a very narrow base from which the higher judiciary uh, gets selected, uh, and 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 there are sort of different generations who come in. Uh, I think the bureaucracy, as I was, as I said earlier. Uh, over time has diversified. I mean, there was a time in the 60s and 70s uh, where uh, people uh, who went to English medium schools, whose parents were pro perhaps also civil servants, uh, went to St. Stephen's College. Uh, these people got in and... Uh, but that's that's changed. But uh, Nanju, I mean, don't forget, uh, people who wield power are not just the judiciary and the bureaucracy. But the people who are funding the politicians and who's funding the politicians? Yeah, that that included. <laughs> sorry, I missed out. Yes, uh, <laughs> business houses, which are few families and political families and bureaucrats and judiciary. When I say bureaucrat, it includes IAS and IPS and uh, uh, some of the other functionaries and uh, judiciary. So there was a business class also identified as a set of few set of families. So. Uh, so that is how it put, I think, five sections. This section rules the country. What has to happen? What policy comes into place? Everything is determined by this set of people, but we are a democracy. So, uh, and the uh, <laughs> only thing is there was no reference to the state in that article. So I was thinking maybe in, uh, 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 the deep state reference I thought was only exclusive to U.S. So... No, I'm, I mean, um, uh, I think elites uh, in most societies um, sort of drive things. Uh, so the question, the interesting question really is, uh, who are the elites in our society? Uh, there are elites from money, there are elites from positions. Uh, I mean, where I live from, there are elites from caste. And all these things matter, elites from journalism, from professions. Uh, and uh, over the years, there have been some changes in the margin of who these elites are. Uh, but uh, one could argue that the core uh, of the elite in the country um, has more or less remained the same. Oh, interesting. Um, per perhaps there are changes, regional changes. Uh, I'm sure the new wealth in Bangalore, for instance, or the new entrepreneurs coming out from Gujarat, uh, they have sort of barged into the elitist club. I mean, before Reliance, uh, uh, before the 80s, in the 70s, uh, one didn't really hear of the, you know, this uh, group or the other major group today. I mean, so there has been a churning there. There were, uh, I think, old world business houses uh, before 92. Uh, in fact, before the 70s, uh, uh, when the multinationals were still agency houses, uh, there was another group of elites. Uh, so so that has changed. Uh, but yes, I mean, uh, at any point of time, we do need to highlight who the elites are. Uh, and that's why things like free speech, free journalism, independent judiciary, are all desirable goals of a democracy because these are the people who shine the mirror on society uh, so that we know who these uh, people are and we try and make them accountable. But uh, there you are. <laughs> so in, in that uh, argument, do you agree with our India's classification in the economist as we are not really plotted under full democracy? Uh, I, I forget the term they put us into. Uh, in fact, uh, I think last year, before last year, USA was sharing the space with us. <laughs> uh, uh, so they use terms like elected autocracy, uh, defective democracy. I mean, this is this is such a wide, vast subject. Uh, I think we should all realize that democracy is much more than just elections. Um, I think democracy is when uh, of course, people's voices are heard, uh, but not only five years, uh, every five years. Uh, 
Uh, there has to be constant questioning. There has to be constant free speech. Uh, there has to be democratic decision-making processes. Uh, the sort of guardrails imposed by the judiciary and independent press uh, need to be in place. Uh, so you, you are an observer of the country. Uh, we should ask ourselves uh, which of these guardrails are functioning, who's shining the mirror, um, are we just an elected democracy or uh, is it a thing which goes on through life? And uh, um, I, I hate coming back to the fact that for the last 10 years, um, I, I, I live a life in rural India. And uh, India to me from where I now live is very different to the India I saw when I was in the civil services uh, or uh, in government of India or or even when, uh, of course, I went abroad, uh, as you mentioned in your introductory statement. Uh, but uh, uh, it's it's a cliche to say there are many Indias, and and I am digressing. But but it is many Indias, and uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, where you sort of uh, sit, uh, you get to see many more. Uh, um, things about your society and about your country, uh, which perhaps you miss if you, you are not in those places. But uh, I don't want to end up sermonizing, but uh, uh, <laughs> that that's what I observe, Nanju. Uh, well, we'll get back into this con conversation. Uh, but uh, uh, coming back to your career, uh, uh, you also had a role in forestry and soil. Uh, 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 conservation. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, lately, uh, and not, uh, I think, for quite some time, it, this has been a concern. Uh, but those days, when you were in that, uh, how, how, what was the perception? Was there uh, uh, any forecasting? Was there a serious effort in sustaining? Because those were the uh, days where India was just about to explode from a growth perspective. So how was the thinking at the government and how were you thinking in terms of, was there a kind of pressure in terms of approaching development? Because much of the development has actually got into this green space because we had to have a lot of infrastructure development. So uh, what was that time and what was the pressure or was that an active participation from that department uh, how was that? No, sure. I I, I think uh, um, one of my uh, jobs was, uh, as you mentioned, with the forestry and the soil conservation department. And again, this was uh, in Meghalaya. I had, uh, I had gone on this fellowship to, to the U.S. And then I came back and for a brief period before I was posted out to government of India in Delhi, uh, I did um, handle these departments. You know, the late 80s, uh, uh, the Forest, Forest Act had been earlier passed. Uh, there was a lot of awareness uh, and a desire to maintain forests. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, the sort of focus on uh, forestry was... Uh, uh, well-founded, uh, and it was pretty strong. Um, what were some of my takeaways from the time uh, I was looking after these two departments? The state I was in, again, Meghalaya, uh, there's a lot of shifting cultivation there. That's why, you know, what they call jhum cultivation. I mean, slash and burn, you do it for two seasons, mm -hmm. and then you move on, and the forest gets degraded. Uh, and then sort of... Uh, um, sort of scrubby jungle comes up in its place. So the importance of the soil conservation department was to have permanent uh, farmlands, uh, have permanent uh, plantations. Uh, I know we were trying to introduce some cash crops. Uh, we are trying to introduce uh, other uh, uh, farmlands which would be more sort of sustainable. Uh, uh, one takeaway is that... Uh, if you enter a pristine forest for an infrastructure development, uh, even with all the safeguards, once human beings have impacted 
disrupted it's never the same again uh, we we all we sometimes argue that uh, you know run of the river hydroelectric projects where you don't dam the river you just have a weir you divert the water uh, you run your sort of turbine and you re-release the water into the river uh, it's sort of uh, harmless as compared to uh, storage dams uh, i i saw one run of the river hydroelectric project not very large uh, being constructed in uh, one of the pristine forest areas in that state just the introduction of human beings in that environment you know labor coming in labor camps setting up their families coming in businesses following uh, it, it has a very uh, devastating effect um, even once the work is done and everybody withdraws uh, those footprints remain there i mean a little shop stays there uh, some business stays there and uh, so one has to be very mindful i mean one understands uh, the need for development and uh, uh, i i think the environmental costs have to be factored uh, into the cost of development uh, uh, there is there is no sort of zero sum game in the sense that uh, you can find uh, situations where you can protect both uh, but uh, it requires a lot of thought a lot of consultation and perhaps additional uh, uh, you know outlays uh, um, but we need to do that if we need to protect our forests and our water and mm. our sources of uh, you know rivers and things like that now that last 10 years you are living in a rural village perhaps uh, closest to the uh, forest and directly uh, i mean the community directly interacting with whatever the positive and negative impact to the soil uh, how do you see how much of your experience was here or do you see you would have approached it entirely differently from your last 10 years experience i think some things have sort of entered our dna this whole issue about a forestation and planting trees even at the village level a young kid also knows that planting trees is a good thing and uh, saving water bodies is a good thing it becomes difficult to sort of uh, uh, do it because of the everyday pressures of survival and living uh, you need that water you need you don't have sewage systems in the rural areas so where does your raw sewage go um, i have a sugar mill in a village um, they are they are uh, regulated by the state pollution control board uh, but is all the outflow being treated the way it should be or is it that during the monsoon season people cut corners and release raw sewage in the water uh, perhaps a little bit of both uh, um, so awareness is much higher i would say uh, the pressures of living in rural bihar are uh, very high pressure uh, life because of the population density um, because of the constant struggle for livelihood uh, and very often environment then uh, uh, suffers uh, on account of that well uh, we'll perhaps revisit when we talk about your present work but uh, then you moved into uh, the most happening ministry at that point in time perhaps that is defined as the india 2 right version 2.0 i was from a today's nomenclature point of view because the post independence era to 91 if is one era post 91 was the second era and you were in the ministry which drove that so did you think like that at that point in time so you are right i mean um, I, i i was fortunate i was posted to the department of economic affairs um, and um, uh, this was 1990 and uh, very soon this economic crisis came upon us uh, mr chandrashekhar was the prime minister and uh, all the pledging took place and uh, the reserve bank of india was uh, in and out um, i was also handling the imf desk in the department of economic affairs 
so one sort of was very closely watching. Uh, I mean, uh, I wasn't a very senior officer. I was just a director, deputy secretary director. Uh, but the RBI was uh, coming in and out. Uh, uh, and then uh, very soon, uh, elections took place and Manmohan Singh, Dr. Manmohan Singh became the finance minister. And um, a lot happened. Uh, um, I saw a lot of this thing happening. Uh, and um, what can I say? Um, these were momentous times. A um, lot of changes were taking place. A uh, lot of policy changes took place. No, in fact, uh, those I two, three to... years, those two, three years determined next 20 years of India, right? And you were there. What was making those policies or how to go about it and so I think Dr. Manmohan Singh had a blueprint in his mind. Uh, before uh, he became the finance minister, even during uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar's time, he had come in to the prime minister's office uh, as an advisor. Um, and uh, he had had his stint at the South-South Commission in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, as you know, Dr. Manmohan Singh is a very seasoned uh, economic administrator for government of India. Uh, even prior to becoming the finance minister, he was the central bank governor. He was in the planning commission. And prior to that, he was the economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance. So many of the instruments and policies of the 70s and the 80s, if you will, uh, he was the author of. And then he changes okay. uh, and he moves away from a dirigistic controlled economy, uh, which I think he was partly responsible for putting in place. No, this is a very interesting uh, argument. Nobody makes this argument. No, he, always... I mean, you look at his his career. Correct, uh, correct. But then, you know, you know uh, the sort of policy orientation or uh, your beliefs and thoughts uh, reflect the ages you live in. I mean, no, it's a very time. good observation, but most times or most often it's missed. Uh, it's always that he is the author of the India 2.0. And uh, what you're saying is that the 20 years prior to that clearly has his own signature all through that because he was very much a party to that. So, so what do you think changed then from then? I, I, I think he, he had been around, uh, I think even in his stints abroad, he has seen that the world had changed. He had seen the successes of many countries. Uh, most importantly, if you look east, uh, you know, think people had, you know, they have revised their policies. And I, I, I would say that, you know, a lot of your thought processes uh, reflect the changing times. And uh, to give him due credit, um, he realized that he needs to change many of the things, perhaps which he had advocated at a time when India needed it. Um, you know, I mean, Nehru, we, we sort of uh, criticized Nehru for coming with a very public, heavy public sector hand and the heavy hand of the government. Uh, but again, that reflected his times. I mean, this is Correct. Second World War has opened. The war economies were run by governments. Soviet Union had succeeded beyond uh, many people's wildest dreams in uh, industrializing in a very short span of time. And the spirit of the time was public sector. Now, by the time the 90s came, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, I believe, and I, I, he has realized that the time for that type of dirigistic economy had ceased, and we need to next move where we open up opportunities for our own people. And uh, I, I remember, uh, uh, I mean, just an anecdote. So we were sitting somewhere and, uh, you know, this, there was a discussion on white goods trade and import licenses had been reduced on white goods. And one of them was this washing machine. And, and somebody said that, but this is a luxury good. Uh, why are we reducing tariffs on uh, washing machines? And he said, ask that poor lady who has to go through the drudgery of washing the family's linen 
whether it's a luxury or whether it's a treasury. Now, <laughs> I mean, this is a very commonsensical answer, but uh, people wanted uh, a, a society where, you know, we could move on and, and have more choices. Uh, and I think he recognized it. Uh, well, uh, I understand you're, you're in a completely different outsider, but uh, this is one thing which bothers me. If you, if, uh, the way I look at it is that what one of the key things that differentiates a developed world to a developing country such as ours, uh, particularly India, if you look at it, that um, any of the developed nations, as we call it as developed, they have 70% of the economy driven by MSMEs including jobs coming out of MSMEs and about 30% coming from the larger uh, enterprises and uh, large sector. Whereas this ratio is inverted in India. Uh, we are about 30. And okay, in the last 20 years, the ratio is go changing to an extent. Maybe I think today we are about 40, 45% MSMEs. But still, uh, uh, though uh, this is happening, uh, uh, though there are uh, very, uh, you know, uh, conversations or at least talking happens from the government side, but doesn't seem to be. Why is it that uh, 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 people such as you see, you also went to US, you lived there, you studied there, and uh, probably you also noticed that, uh, you know, uh, each city perhaps has a small observation is like US has some 10, 15,000 brands of beer. Uh, you know, each uh, each county has its own beer. These are MSMEs, so to speak, right? This is where it produces, it consumes, and economy rolls. So why why did India not think in that direction? Because even post ninety one, much of it was to open up and create opportunity for Indian businesses, which are already established business houses, and which drove more for more of them to become. Uh, I mean, I think what India built on was more of trading. So, which again needed a lot of money and which again only the larger players could come in. No, I think um, I, I totally agree with you that uh, uh, most successful uh, industries, economies, MSMEs are a critical factor. Um, uh, actually, the MSMEs were uh, uh, much more severely hurt during the recent uh, COVID and demonetization and GST, um, th that sort of really cut them at the knees. Uh, but I think it will not be correct to say that uh, uh, people at policy making levels did not recognize uh, the importance of FMSEs. A uh, lot of the companies which have grown uh, uh, into the larger companies uh, started off pretty young. I mean, whether it is pharmaceuticals, uh, whether it is light engineering goods, uh, textiles, I don't want to quote because it has a mixed result. Uh, uh, so there were opportunities. What happened in 92 is that the reservations which were kept for small scale industry, which had made them extremely inefficient. I mean, recall the time when you either bought uh, a small scale industry window uh, uh, air conditioner uh, which was cranky, noisy, inefficient uh, to what you have today. So that reservations for small-scale industry was removed. Uh, but there were many more policies, I think, which came up. Now, uh, what drives an MSME is that the environment, the economic environment, which a large corporate can handle because of more resources, more people, it becomes very difficult for the MSMEs to handle. And therefore, you get into this whole business of uh, can MSMEs thrive without improving on your ease of doing business, which requires transportation, uh, credit, uh, supporting services like auditing and accounting. Uh, and these are all areas which I think we need to uh, look at very closely. I mean, Bangalore, for example, uh, you may have a supporting environment in terms of accountants and auditors. Uh, some other states, uh, uh, including my own, perhaps uh, this is an area which is wanting. Um, and, and I'm really exposed to this because uh, when we come to discussing what I'm doing with Hikmat, 
uh, one of the things we are trying to do is, can we set up a small business to finance my foundation? And we are dealing with these, uh, these, these challenges. So I think uh, we have to do much more for our MSMEs. Uh, I, I think we need to figure out how to uh, get the credit out to them. The banks are basically working with the corporates. Um, and, and we just need to keep on working more and more on these things. True. And uh, how, how was your World Bank experience? What is it uh, that, what are your takeaways or what are your observations and any criticism that you have, if you have? No, I mean, uh, so after two years uh, um, in in the Ministry of Finance, I, I initially went to the World Bank. Uh, we we have a executive director who sits on the board of the World Bank, and the advisor to the executive director uh, is sent from Government of India, Ministry of Finance. Uh, so the executive director during my time was Dr. Bimal Jalan. Um, uh, who was eventually became the RBI governor. RBI governor. And he also was in the Ministry of Finance as an economic uh, advisor. So I went the first uh, few years, I was as an advisor. And the job was more or less... Uh, no, I mean, the World Bank is a different world altogether, if I may say so. I mean, uh, so here I am from Bihar, uh, of course, studied in Delhi, worked in Assam. Uh, brief stint and suddenly you are at an international arena and and you are you are dealing with colleagues from all over the world um, it was exciting times interesting times world bank is a humongous bureaucracy um, but one learns a lot uh, but one also understands uh, uh, the real politique of uh, uh, international uh, world you know pe- Countries pursue self-interest. Uh, self-interest can be diplomatic, can be economic. Uh, in institutions like the World Bank, uh, uh, people bring to bear economic decision-making uh, to pursue their own diplomatic goals. Uh, so where you see through it, uh, how can you get the most for it for your own country? Uh, wherever you have an influence, uh, let's say in the Africas or Latin Americas of the world, uh, can you take uh, actions which uh, um, sort of uh, portrays you as a friend? Uh, so it's, 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 it was a very exciting time and, and a lot of learning for me. Any particular criticism? Because uh, uh, I, I was reading some books uh, recently uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, multiple times uh, it is suggested that uh, uh, World Bank or some of these global organizations were used as instruments by U.S. to contain or engage India and many such countries to drive their agenda, which you did mention in a very subtle way, <laughs> politic, international politics. But uh, <laughs> uh, anything that you quote from your personal experience during that stint in that context uh, of what implications that we had at that point in time? So, look, I mean, unlike the UN, uh, the World Bank Group, which is uh, the IMF and the World Bank and MEGA, uh, there the shareholding is not one country, one vote. Uh, You have the major shareholder, the US, I think they're close to 25% and India is at 5, China, I think, is at 7. So, shareholding matters. And um, if, if I was the U.S., uh, I would try and use my weight uh, for my country's interest. Uh, as, and as representing India, uh, our effort was to ensure that uh, uh, nothing is brought to bear upon us, uh, which would hurt us. Um, I, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, you know, this, this was the time when the Narmada Canal, uh, the Narmada project was being implemented. And it was going into Gujarat. And if you remall, remember, Medha Patkar uh, yes. was leading the agitation. And uh, she the was on the cover of every newspaper here. <laughs> so the environmentalists were, uh, you know, the international NGOs uh, were going to town. Uh, now India is violating 
the environmental guidelines of the World Bank. Uh, so, uh, you know, so one of our challenges was to sort of uh, uh, blunt that criticism uh, to make sure that our project went on. But a time came when uh, it became um, sort of not worth it, if you will, for India or for the World Bank uh, to continue having a relationship in the project because we couldn't do what we wanted. The World Bank was stymied by the international pressure and the US government was happily letting the NGOs drive the World Bank because they couldn't care less. So our recommendation was tell the World Bank we don't need your money for this project. I mean, money is fungible. I can take it for some other project. Uh, so we disengaged with the World Bank on the Narbada uh, River project. So this was a constant game. I mean, there are other areas, uh, you know, where we went out and wooed and, and got money for that. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, during the uh, crisis in the 90s, I mean, the World Bank practically came and wrote us a blank check. Uh, they said, look, there is a funding gap for a liquidity management for government of India. There's an IMF program which was being discussed. The World Bank was given a responsibility. You have to raise X million or billion dollars. Uh, how you do it is your business. So they would choose one or two vehicles. But then what they did was they looked at all their existing projects and wherever there were savings, they carved it out from those ongoing projects and had the omnibus new loan given to India. Now, that worked to our benefit. So you have to find your way in between, uh, you know, other countries' interests um, to, to get where you wanted. Uh, um, as I said, it's an international organization. It's, it's not your government. I mean, <laughs> you have to do your things the... Uh, uh, to the best of your ability. Correct. Uh, see, today uh, there is a uh, today, as in in the last ten years, particularly, there has been a lot of talk about Indian uh, administration is a lot more assertive internationally. You know where what I'm referring to. Uh, so, uh, if you compare it to your own stint uh, and your peers, how do you see that as a person coming from the same mill, how do you see this argument? How fair, how justified, or, uh, or what is the length you would want to uh, the rest of us to wear and look at it? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you are alluding to our foreign policy, uh, current Correct. foreign policy, Correct. and how articulate. Uh, uh, assertive way, is the term. Uh, they okay. they say that India has far been far more assertive in the internationally, uh, unlike ever before. This is so. How do you uh, see that? Uh, no, I think um, the current foreign minister is a very uh, competent foreign minister because uh, he works uh, for the country's interest. Um, whatever is the philosophy. Whatever is that? By the way, he's our batchmate. Uh, we are all oh, seventy-seven <laughs> batch. <laughs> oh, so, so you don't want to be caught on the wrong foot saying anything. No, <laughs> no. I'll, 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 I mean, I, I don't have any criticism because, uh, I mean, I may not agree uh, with a lot of things this current government does, uh, but the finance minister's job uh, is to the portray to the best of his ability uh, the existing belief. Um, of his political masters uh, to as wide an audience as possible. And I think uh, he tries to do that. Now, which is what you're calling a very assertive foreign policy. Uh, I think Indian diplomacy or Indian actions in many of these economic institutions, uh, uh, qualitatively, I think we have always been assertive. Now, there were different styles of doing it. Uh, there was a time in the 50s and 60s, perhaps we came across as too sermonizing. Uh, and this, my colleagues from other countries would tell me that, look, I mean, don't lecture us. I mean, we know who you are. We know what India is. Uh, tell us what you want and we'll move on. I mean, okay. don't sermonize that because you are poor, uh, you know, you are God's chosen one to talk to us about the development. 
Now, I think that's a very fair criticism. Okay. I think uh, now oh, so that was the observation. That was the comment. Okay. Yeah, they would say they would say, uh, and, and this is no secret. I mean, if you talk to uh, many people of our generation, uh, their foreign colleagues would would highlight this point. Uh, and we did come across, and uh, not only just bureaucrats. Uh, I think even the politicians. Uh, I mean, uh, we 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 were sermonizing the world. Now. Are we summonizing the world today? Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, in a different think, tone, uh, though. <laughs> in a different tone. And uh, uh, I, I think strength comes from economic might. If your country is economically strong, even if you whisper, people listen to you. If you are not economically strong, even if you shout, people will not listen. So you so, may have uh, different uh, styles, but if you really want to rule the waves, if you will, get into an India which is strong and powerful, not just GDP growth rate, not just size of the GDP, but per capita income in the tens, 15, 20,000 US dollar, and then see the respect that you get from different countries in the world. So true. And uh, uh, IFC, International Finance Corporation, you spent a whole lot of time there. Uh, so this is very interesting, uh, Nanju, because uh, I was a public sector guy all this while. And even in the World Bank, uh, I think 80% of the job was World Bank related, though the board member was common for IFC and MEGA as well. Now, IFC, I think, as you know, uh, deals with the private sectors of the world. And the philosophy is that if private sector invests, that leads to job creation and it leads to economic development, etc. And uh, that was a sort of blind spot in my mind. Uh, um, and, and, and I was keen to learn what is all this all about. Uh, 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 and... Um, so I consciously thought, why not try the IFC? Um, and, and then I stayed on. The children were going to school there. And I got an opportunity. Uh, and I joined the International Finance Corporation. Uh, initial few five years, I used to work in the financial sector work, which is basically working with banks and leasing companies and stock broking, et cetera. And then I went into petrochemicals and uh, oil and gas. And uh, uh, finally, I ended up being infrastructure, uh, which, is, which had a lot of other things in between. Exciting, learned a lot, traveled the world, uh, met a lot of uh, very astute business people, uh, investors from the first world, uh, investee companies from the developing world. A very enriching experience. And I saw the value of capitalism. I mean, capitalism not in a Marxist sense, but the value of entrepreneurship, of wealth creation. Uh, I, I think these are extremely um, enriching uh, activities. I, I respect wealth creators. I know how hard it is to create wealth. Uh, but then I also believe that everybody should have an opportunity uh, to get to a position whether he or she can be a wealth creator. So this sort of sums up my IFC experience, if you will. Well, uh, in the IFC, at IFC, you actually worked in the most powerful states, right? The banks, the oil and gas, and they were pretty much those who probably form or influence the uh, uh, deep state, like what we talked earlier. So did you did you feel that you know who such people are when you were there? I mean, like in flesh and blood? Yeah, I mean, um, I think when I was in the financial, uh, when I was doing financial institutions, uh, uh, I did a lot of work in the Philippines, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, uh, uh, which was always a pleasure to visit. <laughs> um, Thailand, we, we had a crisis, Asian crisis, I think in 97. Um, but, you know, things go up and down. Uh, uh, 
Philippines um, had a different experience. It's, it, I think it was a very unequal society. Uh, and that sort of hits you when you work in that country. Uh, Sri Lanka, on the other hand, there was still a civil war raging. Uh, that was the time when the LTT had uh, bombed Hilton Hotel in Colombo. So the society was being torn apart. Uh, but um, I, I had I came away with great respect for an average Sri Lankan. Uh, um, I, I, I used to tell my friends uh, among the South Asian countries, uh, apart from being very extremely well educated, um, those guys are very well balanced people, and and I really admire them. Uh, uh, I, I wish they had lived up to the promise they showed in the seventies. Uh, but then, you know, Sinhala nationalism overtook them. Uh, politics, they said, because uh, Sinhalese is the national language, so everybody has to learn Sinhalese. And the old Tamils, who are the elites in the corporate world, uh, they felt marginalized. Uh, but that's a story. I think they went down the wrong path. But um, I always think of Sri Lanka whenever I see a country uh, which is doing well, but is being distracted by ethnic strife or ethnic one-upmanship. And it scares me uh, because these types of ethnic conflicts can undo uh, all the great work which you can do on the economic field. Uh, well, I, I wanted to continue with your work on each of the country, but uh, this question you mentioned, uh, unfortunately, the Silo uh, uh, nationalism or Sri Lankan nationalism, why why is this uh, why do you think today uh, this nationalistic fervor is looked at in such a negative tone uh, across i mean uh, in fact uh, you know recently the google result of who's modi referring to him as a uh, uh, hindu fascist nationalist uh, why is that nationalism is getting identified so significantly with fascism and why nationalism is looked at in such a negative tone, uh, uh, which is uh, even in the U.S. context. Uh, even in the U.S. context, uh, nationalism is looked at as an extreme right uh, and everywhere. So why why is that becoming so negative? Uh, I think uh, in the, in the in Indian context, uh, from what I understand, uh, Hindu nationalism, uh, I think, uh, is a shorthand which the Western media uses uh, because they, they can't understand or they can't explain uh, what is Hindutva, uh, which is a uh, political philosophy which Savarkar and others had highlighted. Uh, so they use the code word Hindu nationalism. Uh, why do, do they get a bad rap? Uh, I think because of the origins and the uses or abuses of this word nationalism. Um, I mean, I'll take you back to 18th, 19th century Europe, late 18th century Europe, where this whole concept of nations uh, came up. And the sort of working premise there was uh, one religion, one language, uh, you know, and sort of in within a geographical area, and that became the nation. So... Then nationalism gets uh, sort of, uh, if you will, uh, uh, conflated uh, uh, with uh, uniformity. Uh, because you're talking about one religion, one language, uh, one common enemy. Whereas when you deal with diverse societies, uh, you cannot have it as a, a uniformity. Uh, you, you have to have much more diversity. And... Uh, uh, and then the abuse of the word nationalism. I mean, uh, even Hitler and fascism uh, uses the word nationalism. Um, you know, Deutschland über alles. I mean, uh, Germany above all. Uh, yeah. So there is this tone in nationalism. We say, uh, we are the greatest, we are the best. Everybody else is there. Uh, which is slightly different from love of your country. Uh, wanting to do good for your country, uh, which I think is better captured by the word patriotism than nationalism. So for all these reasons, 
nationalism is viewed as a much narrower uh, terminology um, and more akin to supremacy, majoritarianism, uh, you know, things like that, which in a democratic sense uh, are not positive connotations. Uh, and, and that's where the bad rap on the word nationalism comes in. That we want the best for our country, I think, is an extremely desirable goal. Uh, but then uh, that itself is not nationalism in a diverse country, uh, where if you become a supremacist and a majoritarian, uh, your definition of India changes. I'm not making well, sense. In this, <laughs> no, no, in this context, how do you present regionalism? And uh, why is that looked at in so strongly negative sense? Again, I mean, it, regionalism has look, become a, a negative thing today. I think, again, because they conflate regionalism with parochialism. That, now, again, regional aspirations can be a very positive aspiration. It can be, and but it should. It should be. I mean, I, I, I don't have a quarrel with that. But parochialism, again, brings the connotation of supremacy. That it's me, it's my experience, I'm above everybody else. Now, I don't know in what context you pose this question about regionalism. Is it the discussion or the debate on uh, sharing of tax resources in the South uh, versus the North? Or uh, did you have something else in mind? Oh, well, uh, yes, uh, multiple of these things, right? One is uh, regionalism, even uh, uh, from an argument of uh, Hindi as a common language across India. I mean, this was an old debate revisited multiple times and again. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, a lot of these things. And, uh, of course, Maharashtra had its own uh, regionalism uh, argument. Goa continues to have, it keeps coming up and going down. Karnataka has had it. Tamil Nadu champions it perpetually <laughs> for at least last 30, 40, 50 years now. So, uh, uh, and uh, that is where consistently, uh, uh, actually, initially, uh, no matter which political party at the center, a national party would always try to paint it as regionalism is not good, one India. Uh, but uh, why is it not good? Is it, uh, 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 it is viewed in the same sense like when you made the argument for nationalism. So that's why I said that in the context of this regionalism, how do you see the uh, nationalism? That's no, where I, 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 again, I mean, I, I would sort of uh, cut it two ways, Nanju. Uh, regionalism could reflect diversity and diverse aspirations right. and to uh, and diverse context. Now, to that extent, I would think regionalism is a positive virtue because just think, what is how was the Indian nation defined in our constitution? As opposed to the 19th century European definition of a nation, we said, whoever lives within the geographical boundaries of this country, irrespective of language, caste, and creed, is member of this Indian nation. Correct. Okay? Because Correct. we recognize diversity. And Correct. that is why our constitution, though in practice it has become much more centralized over the years, the basic DNA of the constitution is towards a diverse India. India is a union of states. I mean, a lot of people right. nitpick on this, but that's the exact word on that. So in this sense of regional aspirations, diverse aspirations, people wanting to do things their own way, I welcome. Why shouldn't Tamil Nadu have more medical colleges? I think they should be allowed to have more medical colleges. But right. when it comes to electoral politics, you want to form clubs. And you want to form emotional clubs because most people vote with their heart rather than with their head. So you can have clubs of caste. You can have clubs of regions. So to that extent, regional is less support for diversity and more of a sub-nationalism for electoral gains. 
Bombay well, for Marathas. You, correct. No, but I'll just give a, a micro-regionalism thing where you were just coming to the Bombay for Marathas uh, okay. argument. Of course, uh, that was a little weaker argument because uh, to a great extent, Ma- Ma- Bombay was pretty much uh, an extended Gujarat. Uh, historically, so that is where the disconnect was. But uh, uh, I'll just talk about Bangalore. I, I I live in Bangalore. I come from Bangalore. Uh, see, here you talk to any native Bangalorean like me. Uh, I, I'm saying uh, it sounds little parochial in a sense because I say native and an immigrant. Uh, unfortunately, there are many uh, immigrants who live here for multiple decades, but uh, you talk to them and they still say that I am from somewhere else, but you are here for the last 20 years, you don't identify yourself as a Bangalorean. So much so that they don't even participate in local elections. And uh, uh, whom do we blame? Because we don't have a strong political ecosystem. And uh, that is where a regionalism of argument of regionalism is growing, that we are having people who don't connect with Bangalore, running Bangalore administratively, we get ministers for city administration who don't connect with the city because they are, represent different constituencies, even politically. And bureaucracy anyway mm-hmm. comes from anywhere. So there is nobody who connects. So this is where cities die. In fact, uh, we talked about sometime back that Bangalore is also referred to as a city in the dying list. Bangalore is up a uh, list. So... Uh, so this is where uh, somewhere if we have the a stronger sense of regionalism, probably these things are do get better addressed. Uh, I I think uh, let's separate the city administration argument versus the migrant labor uh, argument. Uh, I think the migrant labor uh, is a fact of life. Uh, uh, but the process of localization of migrant labor takes time. Uh, I, th- I, no, find I was not referring to the labor of labor, but the migrant community who have settled here for decades, no longer necessarily uh, labor, right? They are, they are in uh, uh, a good lifestyle, perhaps uh, if not l- uh, lower middle class to middle class to upper class to even some of the billionaires are actually from the uh, immigrant community in Bangalore. No, I think the Marwadis were the first migrants, uh, you know, the creme de la creme of uh, Indian capitalism, uh, whether you go to Bengal, Chennai, wherever. Everywhere. But, uh, everywhere. But I think the city administration issue which you highlighted, I think the solution for that is not outsider versus insider. I think the solution there is governance and how the governing uh, institutions and body and people are selected. My experience of working in the IFC or World Bank. Oh, you know, uh, one is uh, sorry, one is elections uh, participation is low, and last four years no election for the municipality happened. No party is pushing for it, and no people are demanding for it because majority of them. So this is where my argument came from. Sorry, please continue. No, I. Uh, that's where I was going. Uh, I'm trying to make the point that most developed societies have thriving urban uh, municipal governance. One of the things which we dealt with in IFC when I was director of infrastructure is what we used to call subnational financing, where basically we were giving uh, uh, loans to municipalities largely in Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union. Uh, for direct uh, municipal activities, bus systems, heating system, gas system. Uh, so that is an area of governance which is much neglected in our country. I believe that direct mayoral elections should be imposed or started in all urban limits within the country. And I mean, uh, strangely, Uh, Bihar has done it. I mean, the last municipal elections, um, all the municipal heads, mayors, chief executives, they're all directly elected. Now, even the ward commissioners don't elect them. So even in Bethia, which is the district town of where I live, a lady, Garima Sikaria, is the mayor of that city. Everybody knows that she's responsible. So 
I think this whole, I think we need to remove city administration and the way it is run from regionalism. You can have regionalism, but the answer to better no. city governance yeah, no, my argument was lack of regionalism is what is leading to deteriorating of city. So that was, that's what I was trying to present. So how do you yeah, think no, this would, will I, change? But, but Nanju, I would argue that if you had direct mayoral elections in uh, Bangalore, and if it was held every five years or four years, Correct. whoever wins the election would be much more accountable. I, I agree with you better. on that. I agree with you on that, but what I'm trying to say is that is not happening because we lack this sense of region. I mean, people don't even feel being part of Bangalorean. That's that's what is leading to. I mean, there is a clear apathy. People don't care. Is there a mayor? I don't know. Oh, no elections have but, happened for the last four years. Oh, but, okay. But Nanju, the answer then is not regional. The answer is that your political executive has to decide that not just Bangalore. Mysore, whatever, Dharwar. No, funnily, uh, every other all place. Cities. <laughs> no, those places have municipal administrations. Bangalore is run by the uh, district in charge minister and the bureaucrats. We don't have citizen representatives. There is no municipality operational for last four years here. No, that's the tragedy. Then I think the fight is for having municipal governance in Bangalore. I would argue, I'm, I, I'll admit I'm not familiar why... It hasn't had elections, but I mean, no, I, I, I was just trying to associate that is possibly because we lack this regionalism thinking and people don't connect or have this sense of uh, pride of uh, being a Bangalorean. Otherwise, you would demand we should have our representative, which is not happening. So that is where I was trying to say that is what, but you, uh, you're saying it should not be there. But we should have election. But I'm saying perhaps it is not there, and that's why we just don't have election, and nobody cares. <laughs> I uh, again, I confess, I don't know the local uh, politics of Bangalore well. Uh, but if it, if if there's a way to instill uh, a mayoral elections in Bangalore, I think you will stop talking about regional. No, you you said uh, uh, I think you should not talk about regionalism for. Bangalore. If, if you if yeah. you had if you had a functioning mayor, you we won't forget have a need region. to talk about you it. Just ask for the performance of the. You Correct. won't have a need to talk about regional. Correct. Correct. So I was just wondering, is that the reason? The so, lack uh, of it is the reason, but you don't think. So. I da I da no I I I mean look, uh, in in affairs of men. Uh, it's not physics. I mean, there could be many things at work, uh, but uh, I, I would sus I suspect. Uh, look, it's not just Bangalore. I think urban municipal city governance throughout our country is a mess, and we all know that cities are centers of growth and development. And good cities attract investment. Bad cities do not uh, uh, attract investments. And the sooner we learn this, the better. True. So, uh, just uh, at a, uh, before we conclude this part of the conversation on the IFC part, uh, you you worked in Turkey, uh, Dubai. I mean, apart from various other countries, as a part of your responsibility that you traveled and addressed things, but you actually spent time in these places as well, right? Apart from uh, Washington in Egypt, uh, UAE, and. Uh, Turkey and incidentally, the times you have spent are also the times where each of these countries were also at the cusp of explosive growth. So, how do you see that versus what is happening in India? So, uh, I mean, all my three positions, uh, of course, the responsibility was multi country, but uh, this is where the sort of main offices were. Uh, I spent four years in Egypt, but uh, the work was from Yemen up to Levant, which is Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and this side to and Iraq and Palestine. Uh, been a number of times to the West Bank and Israel, and this side to Libya. And Dubai, we had our office because uh, 
there was some difficulty in Pakistan. So we used to cover Pakistan, Iran, uh, and the Middle East from uh, Dubai. And by the time we got to Turkey, we had uh, split up our global infrastructure into three parts. So we had one person in Washington taking care of Latin America and Africa. Uh, we had a second person in Delhi who did the two Asia, South Asia and East Asia. And I did the Europe, uh, Central Asia, Turkey, Middle East, North Africa, that belt from Poland uh, eastwards. Uh, how did the, you know, Egypt is an interesting country and uh, um, I, it reminded, reminded me a lot about India, you know, I mean, uh, in, in the sense that everybody acknowledges the potential of that country, uh, but somehow they always uh, uh, operate below their weight level a little bit. Uh, I mean, there was the good old days of uh, Egyptian nationalism. <laughs> under Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, but uh, he got a bloodied nose in 67. Um, and then there had been a series of uh, army uh, people, Sadat and uh, Hosni Mubarak, and, and now you have the CCs of the world. Uh, very well-educated society. Um, women are extremely well-educated. Uh, I mean, this is strange. Most of the Gulf countries, most of the Middle Eastern countries, Barring the Johnnies come lately in the GCC, that is the Saudi Arabia and these monarchies. Uh, the other Arab countries, the women are very well educated. It's the GCC countries where I find, uh, you know, it's far less than these other countries. Uh, not at all uncommon for you to go into a government of Egypt office and deal with a female counterpart. And so in Lebanon and Syria and uh, uh, Jordan in all these places, uh, except maybe in Yemen, you didn't find too many women who were visible. Uh, it's a it's a more conservative society. So Egypt has been on a sort of a yo-yo. You know, there are certain yo-yo countries in the world. I call them. Uh, if you look at the IMF engagement with these countries, you will find that there is sort of a ten-year cycle to them. Uh, there are many Latin American countries. Argentinas of the world, Bolivias, Perus of the world, Nicaraguas of the world, uh, in East Asia, Philippines of the world, uh, in, in the Middle East, Egypt. Uh, you'll find every 10 years the IMF, there's a crisis. And uh, I don't know, they keep, keep seems to be overshooting their successes. <laughs> um, so the time we were there, it was boom time. A lot of investments were coming in. Um, and then, uh, but obviously there's a lot of inequality in that country and that really lent up to that 2011, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, uh, I had left Egypt by then, I left it in 2008. Uh, but you could feel this uh, uh, tension just below the surface uh, that there is an elite um, and, and there is a large mass who are not very, very well off. Um, they get attracted by the Muslim Brotherhood. They are conservative. They are religious. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why the Muslim Brotherhood came into power after the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak. Uh, but they didn't last very long because uh, governance is not their strong suit. I mean, you either sell religion or you sell welfare. I mean, it's very difficult uh, to sell both. Can I? Can I? Uh... <laughs> Great. Like I, I really wish you all the very best and it's just amazing. And once again, I'll urge our audience and listeners to follow this effort and do support in every manner that you can. And also to share this across to who you think will be uh, really motivated to support with or even engaged with. And uh, do come back soon. And once again, Gulis, thank you so much for making time and sharing this with us. Thank you so much, Nanju. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.